I'm giving you seven reasons why you should never hire this doctor, <laughs> which would be me. And so I would be willing to venture a guess that if 80% of you watching just did these seven things, you would never, ever, ever even need my help. I've been in practice for over 17 years. I've seen literally thousands of patients in this time. And I can tell you with absolute certainty as a doctor in practice, okay, this is not me making this up, that these five foods are the ones that cause the most digestive issues, they wreak the most havoc on your gut. And they are pork, that means any kind of pork, it means bacon, it means ham, it means all of this stuff. I, I can give you countless stories of people who I've been working with for their Crohn's or colitis or what have you. They have one bite of bacon, they have one piece of salami, and they're, they're, they're a mess for about three, four days, sometimes even longer than that. So these five come from my time-tested, in-practice examples. So pork is number one. These aren't in any specific order or priority. These are just the five. Two is peanuts because they contain a mold called aflatoxin, A-F-L-A-T-O-X-I-N. Aflatoxin, this is a mold that grows in human environments like you'll find in, in Georgia, South Carolina. But if you have Valencia peanuts, which are grown in New Mexico, most often you won't have such an issue there. And you can get that at Costco, Valencia peanut butter. Um, I recommend cashew butter, almond butter, that kind of thing too. And uh, so then we have corn and soy, primarily because they are genetically modified. They've, these are crops that are heavily sprayed with, with pesticide and things like herbicides, like, like Roundup. Not good. If you find the non-GMO version of a corn chip, that's going to be okay. And so to kind of give you an example of what you're looking for, you know the little butterfly that you'll see? <laughs> I don't know if you can pick this up on my, my sugar. But if you find that, that's a good idea to be looking for corn chips. If you're going to have corn chips that have that non-GMO certified little, little emblem on there. And then we have soy, same thing. So corn and soy are, are um, three and four. And number five is wheat. Okay, so when I say wheat, <laughs> I can't believe I'm out of breath. When I say wheat, I'm so excited. I'm also indicating white flour too, because there's a lot of people out there watching that don't realize that white flour is in fact wheat. Okay, so pork, peanuts, corn, soy, wheat. This is reason number one why you should never have to hire me if you just avoid these foods. Number two is if you just chewed your food <laughs> thoroughly. If you just chewed thoroughly. Okay, remember your stomach doesn't have teeth. Your stomach does not have teeth. Remember that. So you want to chew, 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 chew. All right. You want to chew thoroughly. This is also because in your saliva, you have enzymes that are going to break down certain carbs and starches. So chewing your food thoroughly. And number three is, this is going to catch a lot of you by surprise, is you want to eat less than, eat less than 200 grams of carbs per day. Now you could do way less than this. But if you just ate less than 200 grams of carbs per day, you're going to see a lot of great things happen. Eating less than 200 grams of carbs. How do you do this? You start looking at your food labels, okay? So as an example, if I had two tablespoons of, uh, of Valencia nut butter, that's seven grams of carbs, okay? If I had two tablespoons of a Valencia peanut butter, that's seven grams of carbs. So that just I just subtract that from the 200, now I have 193 to go. If you're looking to lose more weight, like when I need to be doing this, uh, which is now, if I go 150 grams of carbs is what I'll aim for. Some of you that are familiar with ketogenic diet, you'll do even way less than that. But most people out there watching eat way too many carbohydrates. And number four is, this is my bread and butter right here, and this is to take a digestive enzyme. Enzymes are foods. Enzymes are special proteins, okay? And so essentially, if we have a cell in our body right here, if I have my macronutrients, my fats, my carbs, my proteins, the point of an enzyme is to take this fat, this carb, this protein, and make it from this to digesting it to something small like this. So the whole point of enzymes is to take food, fat, carb, protein, even vitamins and minerals, and digest them, make them tinier, so that they can get into the cell. And when, that, when the food gets into the cell, this is called assimilation, Okay, this is called assimilation, this is, and this is when you supply the cell with the, its energy. Okay, digestion is two things. How well you convert food into usable nutrition that reaches its end target, the cell. And the second thing that digestion is, is how well you remove waste. Okay, so enzymes take big chunks of food and they make them little. They digest them, if you will. Okay, why we need digestive enzymes is because we cook our food over 118 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Okay. Once we do this, now the food is devoid of enzymes and now we're asking our gut to work harder. And so what does an enzyme look like? It looks like this. Okay. This is an example of a digestive enzyme. And I recommend you pick up a digestive enzyme at omegadigestion.com. Plug for my own company because this is my formula that I use in practice. And you can go to omegadigestion.com and you can pick up Smart Carb. Okay. And number five is stop putting ice in your drinks around food. So when you eat food, your stomach wants it to be like a little furnace. It wants food to, it wants your stomach temperature to be a certain amount, a certain level. High, okay, like higher than just regular. That was really eloquently stated, just so you know. <laughs> but what happens is when you eat things, um, when you're putting ice in your drinks and you're eating, you are now lowering the temperature of your stomach. No longer is it a nice furnace, which is highly prepared for work, but you are making things in your stomach stagnate. Okay, you're making things slow down and it's in the process of digesting food. Not a good thing. When you put ice in your drinks, when you're eating, that's a bad thing. I'm not talking about if it's a hot summer's day and you're having icy lemonade all by itself. That's fine. But once you put that icy lemonade next to burger and fries, bad news. Because your food's now not going to empty on time. In a healthy digestion, your food should empty the stomach in approximately two hours. Not four, five, six. Okay, now this leads me right to my next thing that I'm going to tell you of why if you do this, you don't need to hire me. And it's kind of piggybacking on this ice thing. And number six is lay off the alcohol. Not to give you TMI or too much information, but I, I do this little test, okay? I seldom have alcohol, like I've said before, if I have maybe two beer in a month, that's a lot for me. But every single time I have beer, or like you, if you have wine or whatever, you're most often doing that with food, right? How many of you are willing to admit, you don't have to answer, but how many of you watching are willing to admit that if you had dinner at six o'clock at night with alcohol, how many of you have an experience where you've burped that alcohol hours and hours later? Here, here I'm, I'm admitting the TMI, right? And it just happened yesterday. I had Ethiopian food, took a great friend out for um, her birthday dinner, and uh, we had Ethiopian food with wine. Not good. I don't know why my light keeps doing that. <laughs> not good. Okay, not good. And I and this has happened over and over before when I've done this. So what I am saying to you is, if you can burp up that wine, or if you can burp up a beer or whatever, four, five, six, seven hours after you had it, what does that tell you? It should tell you that that food has not left your stomach. It should tell you that you have a situation of putrefaction going on in your gut. Not a good thing. And what's really going to help dramatically reduce that to help you get over the bloating, the gas, the discomfort, clearly a digestive enzyme. Okay. And then number seven, take a digestive bitter. And I'll explain what this is in a minute. And you're going to do 15 minutes before you eat. You're going to take a digestive bitter. This is a digestive bitter. These are for sale on my website as well, omegadigestion.com. And what you would do is you would take a whole dropper full of this, squirt it right on your tongue, like you're just gonna pour it right on your tongue, 15 minutes before you eat. What that's going to do, bitters are herbs, they are foods, they are, let me just tell you what's in this one right here. Uh, we've got dandelion, burdock, orange peel, fennel, yellow dock, uh, ginger, gentian. These are examples of bitters. And so different receptor sites on your, or taste bud sites on your tongue, elicit responses in the gut. So a bitter, uh, once a bitter food hits the tongue, the taste bud that is bitter on the tongue, it talks to the hypothalamus of the brain. The, the hypothalamus of the brain says, okay, food's coming. Let's ring the doorbell for the gut to start producing acids and juices to make digestion happen even easier. The problem is, 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 in, our, is in our society now, we don't eat these foods. Okay, most of you maybe have never even heard of gentian root or burdock, right? But the fact is, is back in the day, these are the types of foods people would eat all day long, right? And that would help and aid in digestion. Now, everything is so processed and commercialized and, and uh, irradi um, radiated coming into the country and so on, that we're not getting that, that bitter taste bud connection with the gut because we're not eating these foods. Arugula is another good one. So when you take a digestive bitter 15 minutes before you eat, you are priming the digestion pump, okay? You are priming the digestive pump. And so you could find those bitters at your health food store, or as I said, you could go to omegadigestion.com. So here's a bonus eight, and this one's a biggie. These are seven reasons that you don't need to hire me. This bonus number eight is huge, and it's this. Stop the 
and sanity with antibiotic use. Stop the insanity with antibiotic use. I feel very strongly about this because I see this in practice day in and day out. And what I'm saying to you is this, anytime you have a sniffle, a sinus infection or whatever, and you're constantly taking these antibiotics, you are doing a horrible disservice to your microbiome, which is your body's gut, your body's bacterial fortress. You are ruining it, okay? You are ruining it. One of the questions that every single patient's, uh, patient that comes in gets asked by me is, when was your last course of an antibiotic? Most every single person that comes through here, it's been within the last few months, and most always it's a sinus infection. I don't know about you, but since when are sinus infections deadly to the point where we need to take a, uh, an antibiotic? These are examples of why the medical model is broken. When you have a sinus infection, your body is so smart, it knows how to overcome that, and you have the infection on purpose because increase in white blood cells are hitting that area, and increase in mucus and all kinds of stuff is happening there to kill the bad guys. Why on earth would you want to kill the good guys, which are fighting the bad guys, because when you take an antibiotic, which stands for antibacterial, you are also killing the ones that are, that are fortifying you, because we need bacteria. I have a news flash for you. We need bacteria. We are 10 bacterial cells to one human cell. So whenever you take an antibiotic, an antibacterial, you are killing the good guys too. Countless people are taking so many antibiotics, it makes my head spin. I can't even tell you when I've had an antibiotic. It's been decades, right? It's been decades. Same thing with my entire family. Why is that? It's not that I'm better than you. It's that I rely on, and my family, we know this, we, we rely on the body's ability to heal itself. And I highly recommend you do the same because it is a crazy, crazy thing when you start messing with your body's bacterial fortress, your body's defense with these antibiotics. They're very damaging and they create a leaky gut, all right? How's that for you? They create a leaky gut. Let's say that you've done all of these things and you're still in trouble. Uh, here is how you could work with me in case you're interested. And you would go to virtualdigestiondoc.com. Virtualdigestiondoc.com, that's how you would work with me there, okay? And speaking of leaky gut, if you want my free four-hour course on uh, leaky gut, go to conquerleakygut.com, it's totally free. And I go over four hours of how you exactly can conquer your leaky gut, right? Conquerleakygut.com.